And this is lecture five, the last lecture, hooray, you say, uh, cleaning and disinfection of food safety legislation. And the aim of this unit is to emphasize the importance of working in a clean environment and to raise awareness of the relevant legislation. And by the end of this unit, you should be able to define and give examples of clean as you go and schedule cleaning. Demonstrate an understanding of the uses of cleaning and disinfection chemicals and have an appreciation of cleaning procedures, of premises, equipment and utensils. And lastly, recognise your personal legal responsibilities as food handlers. <coughs> Excuse me. So cleaning. What's the, what is clean? What's the definition? It's the application of energy to a surface to remove dirt and grease. Now here's a question that comes up time and time again. That's all cleaning is meant to do is to remove dirt, grease, grime, food particles. It's not meant to kill or reduce bacteria. That's all cleaning is. And the chemical we use for cleaning is a detergent. It's a chemical used to remove dirt, grease, food particles, grime. It does not, and please remember that because a lot of people get this wrong, it does not kill bacteria. Uh, we need to use another product in order to kill bacteria because we might be uh, working with a food preparation board where we've cleaned it using a detergent, but there might well still be bacteria present, so we need to get rid of them. So we will use a disinfectant. And a disinfectant reduces bacteria to a safe level. Uh, doesn't kill all bacteria 100%. Isn't it? You know, like the old adage on the, the bleachers they advertise on telly, um, it kills 99.9% because .9 some will um, unfortunately survive, but not very many. Um, the sort of things that we can use as disinfectants, you've got chemicals, uh, chemicals uh, such as um, bleaches, disinfectants, or rather disinfectant is a chemical, but there are different types of disinfectants uh, that we use. I prefer not to use chemicals. <coughs> uh, you can use steam, which is water above 100 degrees C, or water at 82 degrees C. That is classed as a disinfectant, uh, where it's at 82 degrees C. Now think on that, that's the ideal disinfectant to use because it's not chemical based, it's not going to taint. It's going to reduce bacteria to a safe level and it's going to act as its own sort of flushing uh, liquid. Other products we use uh, in industry, we use sanitizers. Uh, you might see I'm using these in places like McDonald's, KFC, uh, pizza places. They'll come along and they'll spray a table and wipe it down. They're actually using a sanitizer. So it actually cleans and reduces bacteria to a safe level. Sterilizing is the process of destroying all microorganisms and their spores. Very difficult to apply sterilizing because it needs temperatures of at least 101 degrees centigrade, uh, which is difficult in industry because boiling water only comes to 100 degrees C. Um, it's the sort of temperatures they use in autoclaves, um, which uh, dentists use, for example, when they're sterilizing all their instruments. Uh, you can achieve it in a certain uh, high pressure steam uh, units as well, but in general, we can't get this sort of temperature in the industry. Now let's have a look at the hazards from cleaning. You can get cross-contamination. Uh, for example, uh, you might be using the same cloth in a dirty area as a clean area. Um, a question that uh, sometimes uh, comes up is if you clean in an area and you use the same, same cloth, which would you clean first, the high risk or the raw food area? Uh, you'd use the raw food area first, if, sorry, you'd use the high risk area, uh, clean that first, then the raw food. If you do it the other way around, raw and then high risk, you're taking raw particles into the high risk area. So it's a big no-no. Um, the answer to that is you wouldn't use the same cloth. You'd use disposable cloths, uh, preferably the blue roll towel uh, that you get in a lot of establishments. Uh, better than using, say, the old disposable J-cloths. Um, also, there's, there's more expense involved in the J-cloth type cloth rather than the blue paper towel. And the blue paper towel, just wipe over, throw away, instant disposable. 
Uh, chemical contamination, uh, the cleaning chemicals getting into the food. You've got physical contamination, brush bristles, mop filaments, bits of cloth getting into food. Failure to destroy pathogens. Uh, if you're using uh, a sanitizer, if you're using one that needs to be diluted, for example, you've got to make sure you dilute it to the correct level. If it's under diluted or over diluted, it won't destroy pathogens. Also, you need to ensure that it's within date as well, because once it's past its best before date, um, it's particularly useless as uh, in trying to destroy uh, pathogens or bring bringing bacteria to a safe level. And tainting, uh, if you've got a strong odoured product, uh, that could um, taint food products as well. So clean as you go is the sort of thing you do as a matter of course. You do it there and then. As you make the mess, you wipe it up, you clean it down. That's clean as you do. It's not planned. Um, it's something, it's good hygiene practice. Um, it reduces uh, contamination and obviously the possibility of food poisoning. There is another type of cleaning and it's called scheduled cleaning. Now this is where cleaning is planned. So this is over a period of time. And the cleaning schedule, which would be a poster or a notice, uh, would say on there what needs to be cleaned, who cleans it, when it's going to be cleaned, how is it going to be cleaned, the type and amount of chemical you're going to use, the time you're going to give uh, the chemical in contact with the surface, and for safety reasons, what personal protective clothing you're going to wear. And it must all be checked and recorded by the line manager or supervisor. And on that chart, you'd have a space for uh, the person that's doing the cleaning to actually sign to say that the cleaning has been done. Uh, you might have noticed it in, uh, say, toilets and other areas in supermarkets, service stations, where they'll have a chart saying uh, this toilet was cleaned at such and such a time. Um, that is a cleaning schedule. And surfaces that require disinfection. Now, not all surfaces require disinfection. For example, floors, walls, ceilings. Uh, none of those require disinfection. Two areas that do require disinfection are food contact surfaces and hand contact surfaces. And remember those because, again, it's another key question that comes up. Hand contact surfaces, food contact surfaces. A good example is underneath uh, what comes into contact with food. Uh, knives, tongs, other utensils, slicers, mincers, mixers, containers, chopping boards, work surfaces, production belts, all got the potential to come in contact with food. What's got the potential to come in contact with our hands? And don't forget I mentioned earlier, hands are the biggest source of cross-contamination in a kitchen. Well, we've got handles of doors, fridges, freezers, cupboards, utensils, taps and switches. Something else that needs to be disinfected as well are the cleaner materials and equipment, your mops and your buckets, etc. Cloths are a common source of contamination, so single-use disposable cloths are recommended. It's showing the J-cloth type cloth there, but as I already mentioned, the blue paper towel roll uh, is much preferred because it works out a lot cheaper and is single use and you've thrown it away. And let's have a look at the six stage cleaning and disinfection. Now let's give an example of a preparation board that's been used to prepare food. Uh, we need to start with a pre-clean. That's the initial removal of any food particles, large food particles. Uh, that can go into a recycling receptacle for example. Then we got to main clean where we're going to use a detergent with water and don't forget now this doesn't kill or reduce bacteria to a safe level, it just cleans, it removes dirt, grease and grime. We don't want to leave any detergent on that board so what we need to do then is put in a rinse cycle. Once we've rinsed it, as I said there might well be bacteria underneath the food debris so we put in a disinfection phase. Uh, here is shown a chemical disinfectant. We don't want to leave any residue on that board of the chemical disinfectant, so we pull in a final rinse. And then we'll air dry and store to prevent contamination. Now there is a, a, a double sink dishwashing is another method of cleaning. 
Um, but what you've got here is uh, a sink which contains in the one bowl uh, hot soapy water detergent and in this bowl is water that's almost at boiling point. Um, a lot of companies um, when I've worked in they call them sterilizing sinks but they don't sterilize they disinfect because the water is not high enough to sterilize. So you start with the uh, cutlery and crockery uh, you have a pre-clean, scrape everything into a recycling container, you wash it in detergent water, put it into a rack and dip it into the water then for about 30 seconds, then put the rack out to air dry. Uh, the order of cleaning, always start with the high risk food area, then the raw food area, then the low risk, then toilets. Now it's best to use a colour coding system uh, for cleaning if you can where you use totally separate uh, buckets and mops for the toilet area compared to everywhere else. Uh, again, when I used to work in the industry, we used to have uh, red mops and buckets uh, for the toilet area and yellow then for all the other areas. You also get a colour coding system, which I didn't mention earlier, with preparation boards. Again, it's not a question that um, I've ever seen come up, but you use a different colour preparation board for uh, different foods. Um, as an example, you would use uh, a yellow board for cooked food. You'd use a red board, red board rather for raw food, a blue board that would be for raw fish, a white board for sandwiches and for cheese dairy products. You'd use a green board for vegetables and for fruit, and a brown board for soiled vegetables, so things that are grown in the soil. And washing facilities. You must, by law, have a hand washing sink. And this is a question that sometimes comes up. What must a hand wash facility have as a minimum? Well, it must have hot and cold water, soap and dry facilities. Um, keep other sinks separate. So you've got food and equipment sinks with hot and cold water. Uh, any equipment sinks you should keep separate from the food sinks. And the question might come up, if you've got any problems at all, no hot water, the sink's not working, you must contact your supervisor. And the last few slides, uh, we're going to cover food safety legislation. And what is food safety legislation? Again, <coughs> excuse me, the purpose is to protect public health. Again, you might want to make a note of that, it's another likely question. We've got various acts, we've got the Food Safety Act, We've got the Food Hygiene England Regulations 2006. We've got the EC852 2004 Regulation on the Hygiene of Foodstuffs. And the penalties can be anything up to an unlimited fine, and imprisonment, imprisonment rather, up to two years. Um, although with the Manslaughter Act, if you're found guilty of killing somebody through food poisoning, uh, the penalties could be up to seven years. Uh, so let's have a look at uh, who are the food police well they call environmental health practitioners uh, they're the enforcement officers they're employed by the local council so depending which area you're living in if you've got a problem with food poisoning if you're yourself a victim you contact your local council and has to be put through to uh, environmental health and they will be able to help you uh, what can they do uh, well by law they can give food safety advice they can inspect food premises, they can enforce legislation covering food. Now, <coughs> excuse me, you can see on the uh, identity cards, they've got EHO, that's Environmental Health Officer. Uh, but they uh, these days, they tend to be called Environmental Health Practitioners. So the powers of enforcement officers, EHPs, they can enter and inspect food and premises. Now a question might come up as to when can they inspect food and premises? The answer is at any reasonable time. Reasonable be it meaning uh, when you're normally open, they don't have to give any notice, they can just turn up. Uh, they can investigate outbreaks of food poisoning, they can remove suspect food and have it destroyed. They can serve uh, improvement of prohibition notices and they can initiate prosecution for breaking food safety laws. Due diligence, again, this is a question that might well come up. 
Due diligence really means that you've taken all reasonable precautions to make sure that food poisoning uh, won't occur. Uh, and the actual in definition is there. It's a defence to prove that the business took all reasonable precautions and all due diligence to prevent, to prevent the offence. Now, the due diligence that food businesses use is called a food safety management system. Or you might well have heard of HACCP, H-A-C-C-P, that's Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points. All businesses, food businesses by law, regardless of size, even if you're a hot dog vendor on the corner of a street, or you're a five-star hotel to um, a group of hotels, you must have a HACCP in place or a food safety management system. They have written records. They are records which include things like temperature logs so you log in all your temperatures your freezer temperatures your fridge temperatures your cooking temperatures your reheating temperatures you log in things like who your maintenance contractors are you log in things like your uh, personnel training to make sure you're all food hygiene uh, certificates um, and there's a lot more besides but it's all about written records these written records will be kept in a folder um, obviously, you can keep a computerized system, but you need written records as well to have wet signatures of people doing in, uh, carrying out the cleaning schedules. Um, so these written records are maintained in a file, and that is the sort of thing that uh, you would take to court uh, as a business to prove that you took all reasonable precautions because you've got the proof. It's all written down. You've taken every precaution to make sure the uh, offence wasn't caused by you. And legal requirements of a food handler, you must keep yourself clean, keep the workplace clean, protect food from contamination or anything that could cause harm, follow good hygiene practices, uh, for example, hand washing, regular showering or bathing, wear appropriate protective clothing. Now this one, I've seen quite a few questions come up, is what qualities should protective clothing have? They don't have to be light coloured but they certainly must be clean and hard wearing. Clean being the operative word. And lastly, tell your employer if you're suffering from or are a carrier of a foodborne illness. So that's it, that's the end of the course. There is no revision test now. Uh, what I suggest you do um, is drop an email to Dave Summers, let him know you're ready for the exam. You'll then be registered to take it. Uh, there are 30 multiple choice questions. You need to get 16 out of 30 or 60% 60 correct. You are allowed to take that test three times. So take your time doing it. Uh, you need to tick the box uh, which you think is the right answer. Work your way through and when you finish, um, you will let me know that you finished and I will check your score and I will send you then your downloadable certificate which shows you you've passed the course and exam that followed. So many thanks for following the course.